Chapter One of Cousin Pons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Cousin Pons by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by Ellen Marriage. Chapter One. Towards three o'clock in the afternoon of one October day in the year eighteen forty four a man of sixty or thereabouts whom anybody might have credited with more than his actual age was walking along the boulevard des italiens with his head bent down as if he were tracking some one there was a smug expression about the mouth he looked like a merchant who has just done a good stroke of business or a bachelor emerging from a boudoir in the best of humours with himself and in paris this is the highest degree of self-satisfaction ever registered by a human countenance as soon as the elderly person appeared in the distance a smile broke out over the faces of the frequenters of the boulevard who daily from their chairs watch the passers-by and indulge in the agreeable pastime of analyzing them that smile is peculiar to parisians it says so many things ironical quizzical pitying but nothing save the rarest of human curiosities can summon that look of interest to the faces of parisians sated as they are with every possible sight a saying recorded of hyacinthe an actor celebrated for his repartees will explain the archaeological value of the old gentleman and the smile repeated like an echo by all eyes somebody once asked hyacinthe where the hats were made that set the house in a roar as soon as he appeared i don't have them made he said i keep them so also among the million actors who make up the great troupe of paris there are unconscious eocents who keep all the absurd freaks of vanished fashions upon their backs and the apparition of some bygone decade will startle you into laughter as you walk the streets in bitterness of soul over the treason of one who was your friend in the past in some respects the passer-by adhered so faithfully to the fashions of the year eighteen hundred and six that he was not so much a burlesque caricature as a reproduction of the empire period to an observer accuracy of detail in a revival of this sort is extremely valuable but accuracy of detail to be properly appreciated demands the critical attention of an expert flaneur while the man in the street who raises a laugh as soon as he comes in sight is bound to be one of those outrageous exhibitions which stare you in the face as the saying goes and produce the kind of effect which an actor tries to secure for the success of his entry the elderly person a thin spare man wore a nut-brown spencer over a coat of uncertain green with white metal buttons a man in a spencer in the year eighteen forty four it was as if napoleon himself had vouchsafed to come to life again for a couple of hours the spencer as its name indicates was the invention of an english lord fain doubtless of his handsome shape some time before the peace of amiens this nobleman solved the problem of covering the bust without destroying the outlines of the figure and encumbering the person with the hideous box-coat now finishing its career on the backs of aged hackney cabmen but elegant figures being in the minority the success of the spencer was short-lived in france english though it was at the sight of the spencer men of forty or fifty mentally invested the wearer with top boots pistachio-coloured kerseymere small clothes adorned with a knot of ribbon and beheld themselves in the costumes of their youth elderly ladies thought of former conquests but the younger men were asking each other why the aged alcibiades had cut off the skirts of his overcoat the rest of the costume was so much in keeping with the spencer that you would not have hesitated to call the wearer an empire man just as you call a certain kind of furniture empire furniture yet the newcomer only symbolized the empire for those who had known that great and magnificent epoch at any rate de visu for a certain accuracy of memory was needed for the full appreciation of the costume 
and even now the empire is so far away that not every one of us can picture it in its gallo grecian reality the stranger's hat for instance tipped to the back of his head so as to leave almost the whole forehead bare recalled a certain jaunty air with which civilians and officials attempted to swagger it with military men but the hat itself was a shocking specimen of the fifteen franc variety constant friction with a pair of enormous ears had left their marks which no brush could efface from the underside of the brim the silk tissue as usual fitted badly over the cardboard foundation and hung in wrinkles here and there and some skin disease apparently had attacked the nap in spite of the hand which rubbed it down of a morning beneath the hat which seemed ready to drop off at any moment lay an expanse of countenance grotesque and droll as the faces which the chinese alone of all people can imagine for their quaint curiosities the broad visage was as full of holes as a colander honeycombed with the shadows of the dints hollowed out like a roman mask it set all the laws of anatomy at defiance close inspection failed to detect the substructure where you expected to find a bone you discovered a layer of cartilaginous tissue and the hollows of an ordinary human face were here filled out with flabby bosses a pair of gray eyes red-rimmed and lashless looked forlornly out of a countenance which was flattened something after the fashion of a pumpkin and surmounted by a don quixote nose that rose out of it like a monolith above a plain it was the kind of nose as cervantes must surely have explained somewhere which denotes an inborn enthusiasm for all things great a tendency which is apt to degenerate into credulity and yet though the man's ugliness was something almost ludicrous it aroused not the slightest inclination to laugh the exceeding melancholy which found an outlet in the poor man's faded eyes reached the mocker himself and froze the gibes on his lips for all at once the thought arose that this was a human creature to whom nature had forbidden any expression of love or tenderness since such expression could only be painful or ridiculous to the woman he loved in the presence of such misfortune a frenchman is silent to him it seems the most cruel of all afflictions to be unable to please the man so ill-favoured was dressed after the fashion of shabby gentility a fashion which the rich not seldom try to copy he wore low shoes beneath gaiters of the pattern worn by the imperial guard doubtless for the sake of economy because they kept the socks clean the rusty tinge of his black breeches like the cut and the white or shiny line of the creases assigned the date of the purchase some three years back the roomy garments failed to disguise the lean proportions of the wearer due apparently rather to a constitution than to a pythagorean regimen for the worthy man was endowed with thick lips and a sensual mouth and when he smiled displayed a set of white teeth which would have done credit to a shark a shawl waistcoat likewise of black cloth was supplemented by a white under waistcoat and yet again beneath this gleamed the edge of a red knitted under jacket to put you in mind of garat's five waistcoats a huge white muslin stock with a conspicuous bow invented by some exquisite to charm the charming sex in eighteen hundred and nine projected so far above the wearer's chin that the lower part of his face was lost as it were in a muslin abyss a silk watch-guard plaited to resemble the keepsakes made of hair meandered down the shirt front and secured his watch from the improbable theft the greenish coat though older by some three years than the breeches was remarkably neat the black velvet collar and shining metal buttons recently renewed told of carefulness which descended even to trifles the particular manner of fixing the hat on the occiput the triple waistcoat the vast cravat engulfing the chin the gaiters the metal buttons on the greenish coat 
all these reminiscences of imperial fashions were blended with a sort of after-waft and lingering perfume of the coquetry of the incroyable with an indescribable finical something in the folds of the garments a certain air of stiffness and correctness in the demeanour that smacked of the school of david that recalled jacob's spindle-legged furniture at first sight moreover you set him down either for the gentleman by birth fallen a victim to some degrading habit or for the man of small independent means whose expenses are calculated to such a nicety that the breakage of a window-pane a rent in a coat or a visit from the philanthropic pest who asks you for subscriptions to a charity absorbs the whole of a month's little surplus of pocket-money if you had seen him that afternoon you would have wondered how that grotesque face came to be lighted up with a smile usually surely it must have worn the dispirited passive look of the obscure toiler condemned to labour without ceasing for the barest necessaries of life yet when you noticed that the odd-looking old man was carrying some object evidently precious in his right hand with a mother's care concealing it under the skirts of his coat to keep it from collisions in the crowd and still more when you remarked that important air always assumed by an idler when entrusted with a commission you would have suspected him of recovering some piece of lost property some modern equivalent of the marquise's poodle you would have recognized the assiduous gallantry of the man of the empire returning in triumph from his mission to some charming woman of sixty reluctant as yet to dispense with the daily visit of her elderly attentif in paris only among great cities will you see such spectacles as this for of her boulevards paris makes a stage where a never-ending drama is played gratuitously by the french nation in the interests of art End of chapter one chapter two of cousin pons by honore de balzac translated by ellen marriage this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter two in spite of the rashly assumed spencer you would scarcely have thought after a glance at the contours of the man's bony frame that this was an artist that conventional type which is privileged in something of the same way as a paris gamin to represent riotous living to the bourgeois and philistine mind the most mirific joviality in short to use the old rabelaisian word newly taken into use yet this elderly person had once taken the medal and the travelling scholarship he had composed the first cantata crowned by the institute at the time of the re-establishment of the académie de rome he was monsieur sylvain pons in fact monsieur sylvain pons whose name appears on the covers of well-known sentimental songs trilled by our mothers to say nothing of a couple of operas played in eighteen fifteen and eighteen sixteen and diverse unpublished scores the worthy soul was now ending his days as the conductor of an orchestra in a boulevard theatre and a music master in several young ladies boarding schools a post for which his face particularly recommended him he was entirely dependent upon his earnings running about to give private lessons at his age think of it how many a mystery lies in that unromantic situation but the last man to wear the spencer carried something about him besides his empire associations a warning and a lesson was written large over that triple waistcoat wherever he went he exhibited without fee or charge one of the many victims of the fatal system of competition which still prevails in france in spite of a century of trial without result for poisson de marigny brother of the pompadour and director of fine arts somewhere about seventeen forty six invented this method of applying pressure to the brain that was a hundred years ago try if you can count upon your fingers the men of genius 
among the prize men of those hundred years in the first place no deliberate effort of schoolmaster or administrator can replace the miracles of chance which produce great men of all the mysteries of generation this most defies the ambitious modern scientific investigator in the second the ancient egyptians we are told invented incubator stoves for hatching eggs what would be thought of egyptians who should neglect to fill the beaks of the callow fledglings yet this is precisely what france is doing she does her utmost to produce artists by the artificial heat of competitive examination but the sculptor painter engraver or musician once turned out by this mechanical process she no more troubles herself about them and their fate than the dandy cares for yesterday's flower in his buttonhole and so it happens that the really great man is a Greuze, a watteau a felicien david a pagnesi a jericot a de Caen, an obey a david d'angers an eugene delacroix or a maisonnier artists who take but little heed of grand prix and spring up in the open field under the rays of that invisible sun called vocation to resume the government sent sylvain pons to rome to make a great musician of himself and in rome sylvain pons acquired a taste for the antique and works of art he became an admirable judge of those masterpieces of the brain and hand which are summed up by the useful neologism bric-a-brac and when the child of euterpe returned to paris somewhere about the year eighteen ten it was in the character of a rabid collector loaded with pictures statuettes frames wood carving ivories enamels porcelains and the like he had sunk the greater part of his patrimony not so much in the purchases themselves as on the expenses of transit and every penny inherited from his mother had been spent in the course of a three years travel in italy after the residence in rome came to an end he had seen venice milan florence bologna and naples leisurely as he wished to see them as a dreamer of dreams and a philosopher careless of the future for an artist looks to his talent for support as the fille de joie counts upon her beauty all through those splendid years of travel pons was as happy as was possible to a man with a great soul a sensitive nature and a face so ugly that any success with the fair to use the stereotyped formula of eighteen hundred and nine was out of the question the realities of life always fell short of the ideals which pons created for himself the world without was not in tune with the soul within but pons had made up his mind to the dissonance doubtless the sense of beauty that he had kept pure and living in his inmost soul was the spring from which the delicate graceful and ingenious music flowed and won him reputation between eighteen ten and eighteen fourteen every reputation founded upon the fashion or the fancy of the hour or upon the short-lived follies of paris produces its pons no place in the world is so inexorable in great things no city of the globe so disdainfully indulgent in small pons's notes were drowned before long in floods of german harmony and the music of rossini and if in eighteen twenty four he was known as an agreeable musician a composer of various drawing-room melodies judge if he was likely to be famous in eighteen thirty one in eighteen forty four the year in which the single drama of this obscure life began sylvain pons was of no more value than an antediluvian semi-quaver dealers in music had never heard of his name though he was still composing on scanty pay for his own orchestra or for neighboring theatres and yet the worthy man did justice to the great masters of our day a masterpiece finely rendered brought tears to his eyes but his religion never bordered on mania as in the case of hoffmann's chryslers he kept his enthusiasm to himself his delight like the paradise reached by opium or hashish lay within his own soul 
the gift of admiration of comprehension the single faculty by which the ordinary man becomes the brother of the poet is rare in the city of paris that in whither all ideas like travellers come to stay for a while so rare is it that pons surely deserves our respectful esteem his personal failure may seem anomalous but he frankly admitted that he was weak in harmony he had neglected the study of counterpoint there was a time when he might have begun his studies afresh and held his own among modern composers when he might have been not certainly a rossini but an herold but he was alarmed by the intricacies of modern orchestration and at length in the pleasures of collecting he found such ever-renewed compensation for his failure that if he had been made to choose between his curiosities and the fame of rossini will it be believed pons would have pronounced for his beloved collection pons was of the opinion of chenavar the print collector who laid it down as an axiom that you only fully enjoy the pleasure of looking at your roy style hobama holbein raphael murillo cruz sebastian del piombo giorgione albrecht durer or what not when you have paid less than sixty francs for your picture pons never gave more than a hundred francs for any purchase if he laid out as much as fifty francs he was careful to assure himself beforehand that the object was worth three thousand the most beautiful thing in the world if it cost three hundred francs did not exist for pons rare had been his bargains but he possessed the three qualifications for success a stag's legs an idler's disregard of time and the patience of a jew this system carried out for forty years in rome or paris alike had borne its fruits since pons returned from italy he had regularly spent about two thousand francs a year upon a collection of masterpieces of every sort and description a collection hidden away from all eyes but his own and now his catalogue had reached the incredible number of one thousand nine hundred and seven wandering about paris between eighteen eleven and eighteen sixteen he had picked up many a treasure for ten francs which would fetch a thousand or twelve hundred to-day some forty-five thousand canvases change hands annually in paris picture sales and these pons had sifted through year by year pons had sevres porcelain pat tendre bought of auvergnat those satellites of the black band who sacked chateaus and carried off the marvels of pompadour france in their tumbrel carts he had in fact collected the drifted wreck of the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries he recognized the genius of the french school and discerned the merit of the le Poultre and la vallee poussin and the rest of the great obscure creators of the genre louis quinze and the genre louis seize our modern craftsmen now draw without acknowledgment from them pore incessantly over the treasures of the cabinet des estampes borrow adroitly and give out their pastiches for new inventions pons had obtained many a piece by exchange and therein lies the ineffable joy of the collector the joy of buying bric-a-brac is a secondary delight in the give and take of barter lies the joy of joys pons had begun by collecting snuff-boxes and miniatures his name was unknown in bric-a-bracology for he seldom showed himself in sales-rooms or in the shops of well-known dealers pons was not aware that his treasures had any commercial value the late lamented du Saint tried his best to gain pons's confidence but the prince of bric-a-brac died before he could gain an entrance to the pons museum the one private collection which could compare with the famous sauvageau museum pons and m sauvageau indeed resembled each other in more ways than one m sauvageau like pons was a musician he was likewise a comparatively poor man and he had collected his bric-a-brac in much the same way with the same love of art the same hatred of rich capitalists with well-known names who collect for the sake of running up prices as cleverly as possible 
there was yet another point of resemblance between the pair pons like his rival competitor and antagonist felt in his heart an insatiable craving after specimens of the craftsman's skill and miracles of workmanship he loved them as a man might love a fair mistress an auction in the sale-rooms of the rue des Janaires, with its accompaniments of hammer-strokes and broker's men was a crime of les bric-a-brac in pons's eyes pons's museum was for his own delight at every hour for the soul created to know and feel all the beauty of a masterpiece has this in common with the lover to-day's joy is as great as the joy of yesterday possession never palls and a masterpiece happily never grows old so the object that he held in his hand with such fatherly care could only be a find carried off with what affection amateurs alone know after the first outlines of this biographical sketch every one will cry at once why this is the happiest man on earth in spite of his ugliness and in truth no spleen no dullness can resist the counter irritant supplied by a craze the intellectual moxa of a hobby you who can no longer drink of the cup of pleasure as it has been called through all ages try to collect something no matter what people have been known to collect placards so shall you receive the small change for the gold ingot of happiness have you a hobby you have transferred pleasure to the plane of ideas and yet you need not envy the worthy pons such envy like all kindred sentiments would be founded upon a misapprehension with a nature so sensitive with a soul that lived by tireless admiration of the magnificent achievements of art of the high rivalry between human toil and the work of nature pons was a slave to that one of the seven deadly sins with which god surely will deal least hardly pons was a glutton a narrow income combined with a passion for bric-a-brac condemned him to a regimen so abhorrent to a discriminating palate that bachelor as he was he had cut the knot of the problem by dining out every day now in the time of the empire celebrities were more sought after than at present perhaps because there were so few of them perhaps because they made little or no political pretension in those days besides you could set up for a poet a musician or a painter with so little expense pons being regarded as the probable rival of nicolo payer and berton used to receive so many invitations that he was forced to keep a list of engagements much as barristers note down the cases for which they are retained and pons behaved like an artist he presented his amphitryons with copies of his songs he obliged at the pianoforte he brought them orders for boxes at the Fado, his own theatre he organized concerts he was not above taking the fiddle himself sometimes in a relation's house and getting up a little impromptu dance in those days all the handsome men in france were away at the wars exchanging sabre cuts with the handsome men of the coalition pons was said to be not ugly but peculiar looking after the grand rule laid down by moliere in eliant's famous couplets but if he sometimes heard himself described as a charming man after he had done some fair lady a service his good fortune went no further than words it was between the years eighteen ten and eighteen sixteen that pons contracted the unlucky habit of dining out he grew accustomed to see his hosts taking pains over the dinner procuring the first and best of everything bringing out their choicest vintages seeing carefully to the dessert the coffee the liqueurs giving him of their best in short the best moreover of those times of the empire when paris was glutted with kings and queens and princes and many a private house emulated royal splendors people used to play at royalty then as they play nowadays at parliament creating a whole host of societies with presidents vice-presidents secretaries and what not 
agricultural societies industrial societies societies for the promotion of sericulture viticulture the growth of flax and so forth some have even gone so far as to look about them for social evils in order to start a society to cure them but to return to pons a stomach thus educated is sure to react upon the owner's moral fibre the demoralization of the man varies directly with his progress in culinary sapience voluptuousness lurking in every secret recess of the heart lays down the law therein honor and resolution are battered in breach the tyranny of the palate has never been described as a necessity of life it escapes the criticism of literature yet no one imagines how many have been ruined by the table the luxury of the table is indeed in this sense the courtesan's one competitor in paris besides representing in a manner the credit side in another account where she figures as the expenditure with pons's decline and fall as an artist came his simultaneous transformation from invited guest to parasite and hanger-on he could not bring himself to quit dinners so excellently served for the spartan broth of a two-franc ordinary alas alas a shudder ran through him at the mere thought of the great sacrifices which independence required him to make he felt that he was capable of sinking to even lower depths for the sake of good living if there were no other way of enjoying the first and best of everything of guzzling vulgar but expressive word nice little dishes carefully prepared pons lived like a bird pilfering his meal flying away when he had taken his fill singing a few notes by way of return he took a certain pleasure in the thought that he lived at the expense of society which asked of him what but the trifling toll of grimaces like all confirmed bachelors who hold their lodgings in horror and live as much as possible in other people's houses pons was accustomed to the formulas and facial contortions which do duty for feeling in the world he used compliments as small change and as far as others were concerned he was satisfied with the labels they bore and never plunged a too curious hand into the sack this not intolerable phase lasted for another ten years such years pons's life was closing with a rainy autumn all through those years he contrived to dine without expense by making himself necessary in the houses which he frequented he took the first step in the downward path by undertaking a host of small commissions many and many a time pons ran on errands instead of the porter or the servant many a purchase he made for his entertainers he became a kind of harmless well-meaning spy sent by one family into another but he gained no credit with those for whom he trudged about and so often sacrificed self-respect pons is a bachelor said they he is at a loss to know what to do with his time he is only too glad to trot about for us what else would he do very soon the cold which old age spreads about itself began to set in the communicable cold which sensibly lowers the social temperature especially if the old man is ugly and poor old and ugly and poor is not this to be thrice old pons's winter had begun the winter which brings the reddened nose and frost-nipped cheeks and the numbed fingers numb in how many ways invitations very seldom came for pons now so far from seeking the society of the parasite every family accepted him much as they accepted the taxes they valued nothing that pons could do for them real services from pons counted for naught the family circles in which the worthy artist revolved had no respect for art or letters they went down on their knees to practical results 
they valued nothing but the fortune or social position acquired since the year eighteen thirty the bourgeoisie is afraid of intellect and genius but pons's spirit and manner were not haughty enough to overawe his relations and naturally he had come at last to be accounted less than nothing with them though he was not altogether despised he had suffered acutely among them but like all timid creatures he kept silence as to his pain and so by degrees schooled himself to hide his feelings and learned to take sanctuary in his inmost self many superficial persons interpret this conduct by the short word selfishness and indeed the resemblance between the egoist and the solitary human creature is strong enough to seem to justify the harsher verdict and this is especially true in paris where nobody observes others closely where all things pass swift as waves and last as little as a ministry so cousin pons was accused of selfishness behind his back and if the world accuses any one it usually finds him guilty and condemns him into the bargain pons bowed to the decision do any of us know how such a timid creature is cast down by an unjust judgment who will ever paint all that the timid suffer this state of things now growing daily worse explains the sad expression on the poor old musician's face he lived by capitulations of which he was ashamed every time we sin against self-respect at the bidding of the ruling passion we rivet its hold upon us the more that passion requires of us the stronger it grows every sacrifice increasing as it were the value of a satisfaction for which so much has been given up till the negative sum total of renouncements looms very large in a man's imagination pons for instance after enduring the insolently patronizing looks of some bourgeois encased in buckram of stupidity sipped his glass of port or finished his quail with bread-crumbs and relished something of the savour of revenge besides it is not too dear at the price he said to himself after all in the eyes of the moralist there were extenuating circumstances in pons's case man only lives in fact by some personal satisfaction the passionless perfectly righteous man is not human he is a monster an angel wanting wings the angel of christian mythology has nothing but a head on earth the righteous person is the sufficiently tiresome grandison for whom the very venus of the crosswords is sexless setting aside one or two commonplace adventures in italy in which probably the climate accounted for his success no woman had ever smiled upon pons plenty of men are doomed to this fate pons was an abnormal birth the child of parents well stricken in years he bore the stigma of his untimely genesis his cadaverous complexion might have been contracted in the flask of spirit of wine in which science preserves some extraordinary fetus artist though he was with his tender dreamy sensitive soul he was forced to accept the character which belonged to his face it was hopeless to think of love and he remained a bachelor not so much of choice as of necessity then gluttony the sin of the continent monk beckoned to pons he rushed upon temptation as he had thrown his whole soul into the adoration of art and the cult of music good cheer and bric-a-brac gave him the small change for the love which could spend itself in no other way as for music it was his profession and where will you find the man who is in love with his means of earning a livelihood for it is with a profession as with marriage in the long length you are sensible of nothing but the drawbacks bria savarin has deliberately set himself to justify the gastronome but perhaps even he has not dwelt sufficiently on the reality of the pleasures of the table 
the demands of digestion upon the human economy produce an internal wrestling bout of human forces which rivals the highest degree of amorous pleasure the gastronome is conscious of an expenditure of vital power an expenditure so vast that the brain is atrophied as it were that a second brain located in the diaphragm may come into play and the suspension of all the faculties is in itself a kind of intoxication a boa constrictor gorged with an ox is so stupid with excess that the creature is easily killed what man on the wrong side of forty is rash enough to work after dinner and remark in the same connection that all great men have been moderate eaters the exhilarating effect of the wing of a chicken upon invalids recovering from serious illness and long confined to a stinted and carefully chosen diet has been frequently remarked the sober pons whose whole enjoyment was concentrated in the exercise of his digestive organs was in the position of chronic convalescence he looked to his dinner to give him the utmost degree of pleasurable sensation and hitherto he had procured such sensations daily who dares to bid farewell to old habit many a man on the brink of suicide has been plucked back on the threshold of death by the thought of the cafe where he plays his nightly game of dominoes End of chapter two Chapter Three of Cousin Pons by Honore de Balzac, translated by Ellen Marriage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Three. In the year eighteen thirty five, chance avenged Pons for the indifference of womankind by finding him a prop for his declining years, as the saying goes, and he who had been old from his cradle found a support in friendship pons took to himself the only life-partner permitted to him among his kind an old man and a fellow-musician but for la fontaine's fable les deux amis this sketch should have borne the title of the two friends but to take the name of this divine story would surely be a deed of violence a profanation from which every true man of letters would shrink the title ought to be borne alone and for ever by the fabulist's masterpiece the revelation of his soul and the record of his dreams those three words were set once and for ever by the poet at the head of a page which is his by a sacred right of ownership for it is a shrine before which all generations all over the world will kneel so long as the art of printing shall endure pons's friend gave lessons on the pianoforte they met and struck up an acquaintance in eighteen thirty four one prize day at a boarding school and so congenial were their ways of thinking and living that pons used to say that he had found his friend too late for his happiness never perhaps did two souls so much alike find each other in the great ocean of humanity which flowed forth in disobedience to the will of god from its source in the garden of eden before very long the two musicians could not live without each other confidences were exchanged and in a week's time they were like brothers schmucke for that was his name had not believed that such a man as pons existed nor had pons imagined that a schmucke was possible here already you have a sufficient description of the good couple but it is not every mind that takes kindly to the concise synthetic method and a certain amount of demonstration is necessary if the credulous are to accept the conclusion this pianist like all other pianists was a german a german like the eminent liszt and the great mendelssohn and steibelt and dussek and meyer and mozart and Duller and talberg and dreschock and hiller and leopold hertz wurz karr wolf pixis and clara wieck and all germans generally speaking schmucke was a great musical composer 
doomed to remain a music master so utterly did his character lack the audacity which a musical genius needs if he is to push his way to the front a german's naivety does not invariably last him through his life in some cases it fails after a certain age and even as a cultivator of the soil brings water from afar by means of irrigation channels so from the springs of his youth does the teuton draw the simplicity which disarms suspicion the perennial supplies with which he fertilizes his labors in every field of science art or commerce a crafty frenchman here and there will turn a parisian tradesman's stupidity to good account in the same way but schmucke had kept his child's simplicity much as pons continued to wear his relics of the empire all unsuspectingly the true and noble-hearted german was at once the theatre and the audience making music within himself for himself alone in this city of paris he lived as a nightingale lives among the thickets and for twenty years he sang on mateless till he met with a second self in pons both pons and schmucke were abundantly given both by heart and disposition to the peculiarly german sentimentality which shows itself alike in childlike ways in a passion for flowers in that form of nature worship which prompts a german to plant his garden beds with big glass globes for the sake of seeing miniature pictures of the view which he can behold about him of a natural size in the inquiring turn of mind that sets a learned teuton trudging three hundred miles in his gaiters in search of a fact which smiles up in his face from a wayside spring or lurks laughing under the jessamine leaves in the back yard or to take a final instance in the german craving to endow every least detail in creation with a spiritual significance a craving which produces sometimes hoffman's tipsiness in type sometimes the folios with which germany hedges the simplest questions round about lest haply any fool should fall into her intellectual excavations and indeed if you fathom these abysses you find nothing but a german at the bottom both friends were catholics they went to mass and performed the duties of religion together and like children found nothing to tell their confessors it was their firm belief that music is to feeling and thought as thought and feeling are to speech and of their converse on this system there was no end each made response to the other in orgies of sound demonstrating their convictions each for each like lovers schmucke was as absent-minded as pons was wide awake pons was a collector schmucke a dreamer of dreams schmucke was a student of beauty seen by the soul pons a preserver of material beauty pons would catch sight of a china cup and buy it in the time that schmucke took to blow his nose wondering the while within himself whether the musical phrase that was ringing in his brain the motif from rossini or bellini or beethoven or mozart had its origin or its counterpart in the world of human thought and emotion schmucke's economies were controlled by an absent mind pons was a spendthrift through passion and for both the result was the same they had not a penny on st sylvester's day perhaps pons would have given way under his troubles if it had not been for this friendship but life became bearable when he found some one to whom he could pour out his heart the first time that he breathed a word of his difficulties the good german had advised him to live as he himself did and eat bread and cheese at home sooner than dine abroad at such a cost alas pons did not dare to confess that heart and stomach were at war within him that he could digest affronts which pained his heart and cost what it might a good dinner that satisfied his palate was a necessity to him even as your gay lothario must have a mistress to tease in time schmucke understood 
not just at once for he was too much of a teuton to possess that gift of swift perception in which the french rejoice schmucke understood and loved poor pons the better nothing so fortifies a friendship as a belief on the part of one friend that he is superior to the other an angel could not have found a word to say to schmucke rubbing his hands over the discovery of the hold that gluttony had gained over pons indeed the good german adorned their breakfast-table next morning with delicacies of which he went in search himself and every day he was careful to provide something new for his friend for they always breakfasted together at home if any one imagines that the pair could not escape ridicule in paris where nothing is respected he cannot know that city when schmucke and pons united their riches and poverty they hit upon the economical expedient of lodging together each paying half the rent of the very unequally divided second floor of a house in the rue de normandie in the marais and as it often happened that they left home together and walked side by side along their beat of boulevard the idlers of the quarter dubbed them the pair of nutcrackers a nickname which makes any portrait of schmucke quite superfluous for he was to pons as the famous statue of the nurse of niobe in the vatican is to the tribune venus madame cibot portress of the house in the rue de normandie was the pivot on which the domestic life of the nutcrackers turned but madame cibot plays so large a part in the drama which grew out of their double existence that it will be more appropriate to give her portrait on her first appearance in this scene of parisian life one thing remains to be said of the characters of the pair of friends but this one thing is precisely the hardest to make clear to ninety-nine readers out of a hundred in this forty-seventh year of the nineteenth century perhaps by reason of the prodigious financial development brought about by the railway system it is a little thing and yet it is so much it is a question in fact of giving an idea of the extreme sensitiveness of their natures let us borrow an illustration from the railways if only by way of retaliation as it were for the loans which they levy upon us the railway train of to-day tearing over the metals grinds away fine particles of dust grains so minute that a traveller cannot detect them with the eye but let a single one of those invisible motes find its way into the kidneys it will bring about that most excruciating and sometimes fatal disease known as gravel and our society rushing like a locomotive along its metalled track is heedless of the all but imperceptible dust made by the grinding of the wheels but it was otherwise with the two musicians the invisible grains of sand sank perpetually into the very fibres of their being causing them intolerable anguish of heart tender exceedingly to the pain of others they wept for their own powerlessness to help and their own susceptibilities were almost morbidly acute neither age nor the continual spectacle of the drama of paris life had hardened two souls still young and childlike and pure the longer they lived indeed the more keenly they felt their inward suffering for so it is alas with natures unsullied by the world with the quiet thinker and with such poets among the poets as have never fallen into any excess since the old men began housekeeping together the day's routine was very nearly the same for them both they worked together in harness in the fraternal fashion of the paris cab horse rising every morning summer and winter at seven o'clock and setting out after breakfast to give music lessons in the boarding schools in which upon occasion they would take lessons for each other towards noon pons repaired to his theatre if there was a rehearsal on hand but all his spare moments were spent in sauntering on the boulevards night found both of them in the orchestra at the theatre for pons had found a place for schmucke and upon this wise 
at the time of their first meeting pons had just received that marshal's baton of the unknown musical composer an appointment as conductor of an orchestra it had come to him unasked by a favor of count popinot a bourgeois hero of july at that time a member of the government count popinot had the license of a theatre in his gift and count popinot had also an old acquaintance of the kind that the successful man blushes to meet as he rolls through the streets of paris in his carriage it is not pleasant to see his boyhood's chum down at heel with a coat of many improbable colours and trousers innocent of straps and a head full of soaring speculations on too grand a scale to tempt shy easily scared capital moreover this friend of his youth gaudissart by name had done not a little in the past towards founding the fortunes of the great house of popinot popinot now a count and a peer of france after twice holding a portfolio had no wish to shake off the illustrious gaudissart quite otherwise the pomps and vanities of the court of the citizen king had not spoiled the sometime druggist's kind heart he wished to put his ex-commercial traveller in the way of renewing his wardrobe and replenishing his purse so when gaudissart always an enthusiastic admirer of the fair sex applied for the license of a bankrupt theatre popinot granted it on condition that pons a parasite of the hotel popinot should be engaged as conductor of the orchestra and at the same time the count was careful to send certain elderly amateurs of beauty to the theatre so that the new manager might be strongly supported financially by wealthy admirers of feminine charms revealed by the costume of the ballet gaudissart and company who be it said made their fortune hit upon the grand idea of operas for the people and carried it out in a boulevard theatre in eighteen thirty four a tolerable conductor who could adapt or even compose a little music upon occasion was a necessity for ballets and pantomimes but the last management had so long been bankrupt that they could not afford to keep a transposer and copyist pons therefore introduced schmucke to the company as copier of music a humble calling which requires no small musical knowledge and schmucke acting on pons's advice came to an understanding with the chef de service at the opera comique so saving himself the clerical drudgery the partnership between pons and schmucke produced one brilliant result schmucke being a german harmony was his strong point he looked over the instrumentation of pons's compositions and pons provided the airs here and there an amateur among the audience admired the new pieces of music which served as accompaniment to two or three great successes but they attributed the improvement vaguely to progress no one cared to know the composer's name like occupants of the baignoire lost to view of the house to gain a view of the stage pons and schmucke eclipsed themselves by their success in paris especially since the revolution of july no one can hope to succeed unless he will push his way quibus cumque vius and with all his might through a formidable host of competitors but for this feat a man needs thews and sinews and our two friends be it remembered had that affection of the heart which cripples all ambitious effort pons as a rule only went to his theatre towards eight o'clock when the piece in favour came on and overtures and accompaniments needed the strict ruling of the baton most minor theatres are lax in such matters and pons felt the more at ease because he himself had been by no means grasping in all his dealings with the management and schmucke if need be could take his place time went by and schmucke became an institution in the orchestra the illustrious gaudissart said nothing but he was well aware of the value of pons's collaborator he was obliged to include a pianoforte in the orchestra following the example of the leading theatres the instrument was placed beside the conductor's chair and schmucke played without increase of salary a volunteer supernumerary 
as schmucke's character his utter lack of ambition or pretense became known the orchestra recognized him as one of themselves and as time went on he was entrusted with the often needed miscellaneous musical instruments which form no part of the regular band of a boulevard theatre for a very small addition to his stipend schmucke played the viola d'amore hautboy violoncello and harp as well as the piano the castanets for the cachucha the bells saxhorn and the like if the germans cannot draw harmony from the mighty instruments of liberty yet to play all instruments of music comes to them by nature the two old artists were exceedingly popular at the theatre and took its ways philosophically they had put as it were scales over their eyes lest they should see the offences that needs must come when a corps de ballet is blended with actors and actresses one of the most trying combinations ever created by the laws of supply and demand for the torment of managers authors and composers alike every one esteemed pons with his kindness and his modesty his great self-respect and respect for others for a pure and limpid life wins something like admiration from the worst nature in every social sphere and in paris a fair virtue meets with something of the success of a large diamond so great a rarity it is no actor no dancer however brazen would have indulged in the mildest practical joke at the expense of either pons or schmucke pons very occasionally put in an appearance in the foyer but all that schmucke knew of the theatre was the underground passage from the street door to the orchestra sometimes however during an interval the good german would venture to make a survey of the house and ask a few questions of the first flute a young fellow from strasbourg who came of a german family at kehl gradually under the flute's tuition schmucke's childlike imagination acquired a certain amount of knowledge of the world he could believe in the existence of that fabulous creature the lorette the possibility of marriages at the thirteenth arrondissement the vagaries of the leading lady and the contraband traffic carried on by box openers in his eyes the more harmless forms of vice were the lowest depths of babylonish iniquity he did not believe the stories he smiled at them for grotesque inventions the ingenious reader can see that pons and schmucke were exploited to use a word much in fashion but what they lost in money they gained in consideration and kindly treatment it was after the success of the ballet with which a run of success began for the gaudissart company that the management presented pons with a piece of plate a group of figures attributed to benvenuto cellini the alarming costliness of the gift caused talk in the green-room it was a matter of twelve hundred francs pons poor honest soul was for returning the present and gaudissart had a world of trouble to persuade him to keep it ah said the manager afterwards when he told his partner of the interview if we could only find actors up to that sample in their joint life outwardly so quiet there was the one disturbing element the weakness to which pons sacrificed the insatiable craving to dine out whenever schmucke happened to be at home while pons was dressing for the evening the good german would bewail this deplorable habit if only he was any fatter for it he many a time cried and schmucke would dream of curing his friend of his degrading vice for a true friend's instinct in all that belongs to the inner life is unerring as a dog's sense of smell a friend knows by intuition the trouble in his friend's soul and guesses at the cause and ponders it in his heart pons who always wore a diamond ring on the little finger of his right hand an ornament permitted in the time of the empire but ridiculous to-day pons who belonged to the troubadour time the sentimental periods of the first empire 
was too much a child of his age too much of a frenchman to wear the expression of divine serenity which softened schmucke's hideous ugliness from pons's melancholy looks schmucke knew that the profession of parasite was growing daily more difficult and painful and in fact in that month of october eighteen forty four the number of houses at which pons dined was naturally much restricted reduced to move round and round the family circle he had used the word family in far too wide a sense as will shortly be seen m camusot the rich silk mercer of the rue des bourdonnais had married pons's first cousin mademoiselle pons only child and heiress of one of the well-known firm of pons brothers court embroiderers pons's own father and mother retired from a firm founded before the revolution of seventeen eighty nine leaving their capital in the business until mademoiselle pons's father sold it in eighteen fifteen to m rivet m camusot had since lost his wife and married again and retired from business some ten years and now in eighteen forty four he was a member of the board of trade a deputy and what not but the camusot clan were friendly and pons good man still considered that he was some kind of cousin to the children of the second marriage who were not relations or even connected with him in any way the second madame camusot being a mademoiselle cardot pons introduced himself as a relative into the tolerably numerous cardot family a second bourgeois tribe which taken with its connections formed quite as strong a clan as the camusots for cardot the notary brother of the second madame camusot had married a mademoiselle chiffreville and the well-known family of chiffreville the leading firm of manufacturing chemists was closely connected with the whole drug trade of which m anselm papineau was for many years the undisputed head until the revolution of july plunged him into the very centre of the dynastic movement as everybody knows so pons in the wake of the camusots and cardots reached the chiffreville's and thence the papineaux's always in the character of a cousin's cousin the above concise statement of pons's relations with his entertainers explains how it came to pass that an old musician was received in eighteen forty four as one of the family in the houses of four distinguished persons to wit m le comte popinot peer of france and twice in office m cardot retired notary mayor and deputy of an arrondissement in paris m camusot senior a member of the board of trade and the municipal chamber and a peerage and lastly m camusot de marville camusot's son by his first marriage and pons's one genuine relation albeit even he was a first cousin once removed this camusot president of a chamber of the court of appeal in paris had taken the name of his estate at marville to distinguish himself from his father and a younger half-brother cardot the retired notary had married his daughter to his successor whose name was berthier and pons transferred as part of the connection acquired a right to dine with the berthiers in the presence of a notary as he put it this was the bourgeois empyrean which pons called his family that upper world in which he so painfully reserved his right to a knife and fork of all these houses some ten in all the one in which pons ought to have met with the kindest reception should by rights have been his own cousins and indeed he paid most attention to president camusot's family but alas madame camusot de marville daughter of the sieur Thirion, usher of the cabinet to louis the eighteenth and charles the tenth had never taken very kindly to her husband's first cousin once removed pons had tried to soften this formidable relative he wasted his time for in spite of the pianoforte lessons which he gave gratuitously to mademoiselle camusot a young woman with hair somewhat inclined to red 
it was impossible to make a musician of her and now at this very moment as he walked with that precious object in his hand pons was bound for the president's house where he always felt as if he were at the tuileries itself so heavily did the solemn green curtains the carmelite brown hangings thick piled carpets heavy furniture and general atmosphere of magisterial severity oppress his soul strange as it may seem he felt more at home in the hotel papineau rue basse du rempart probably because it was full of works of art for the master of the house since he entered public life had acquired a mania for collecting beautiful things by way of contrast no doubt for a politician is obliged to pay for secret services of the ugliest kind End of chapter three Chapter Four of Cousin Pons by Honore de Balzac, translated by Ellen Marriage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Four. President de Marville lived in the Rue de Hanovre, in a house which his wife had bought ten years previously on the death of her parents, for the Sieur and Dame Tyrion left their daughter about a hundred and fifty thousand francs, the savings of a lifetime with its north aspect the house looks gloomy enough seen from the street but the back looks towards the south over the courtyard with a rather pretty garden beyond it as the president occupied the whole of the first floor once the abode of a great financier of the time of louis the fourteenth and the second was let to a wealthy old lady the house wore a look of dignified repose befitting a magistrate's residence President Camusot had invested all that he inherited from his mother, together with the savings of twenty years, in the purchase of the splendid Marville estate, a chateau as fine a relic of the past as you will find to-day in Normandy, standing in a hundred acres of parkland, and a fine dependent farm, nominally bringing in twelve thousand francs per annum, though as it cost the President at least a thousand crowns to keep up a state almost princely in our days, his yearly revenue all told as the saying is was a bare nine thousand francs with this and his salary the president's income amounted to about twenty thousand francs but though to all appearance a wealthy man especially as one half of his father's property would one day revert to him as the only child of the first marriage he was obliged to live in paris as befitted his official position and monsieur and madame de marville spent almost the whole of their incomes indeed before the year eighteen thirty four they felt pinched this family schedule sufficiently explains why mademoiselle de marville aged three and twenty was still unwed in spite of a hundred thousand francs of dowry and tempting prospects frequently skilfully but so far vainly held out for the past five years pons had listened to madame la presidente's lamentations as she beheld one young lawyer after another led to the altar while all the newly appointed judges at the tribunal were fathers of families already and she all this time had displayed mademoiselle de marville's brilliant expectations before the undazzled eyes of young vicomte popineau eldest son of the great man of the drug trade he of whom it was said by the envious tongues of the neighbourhood of the rue des lombards that the revolution of july had been brought about at least as much for his particular benefit as for the sake of the orleans branch arrived at the corner of the rue de choiseul and the rue de hanovre pons suffered from the inexplicable emotions which torment clear consciences for a panic terror such as the worst of scoundrels might feel at the sight of a policeman an agony caused solely by a doubt as to madame de marville's probable reception of him that grain of sand grating continually on the fibres of his heart so far from losing its angles grew more and more jagged and the family in the rue de hanovre always sharpened the edges indeed their unceremonious treatment and pons's depreciation in value among them 
had affected the servants and while they did not exactly fail in respect they looked on the poor relation as a kind of beggar pons's arch enemy in the house was the lady's maid a thin and wizened spinster madeleine vivet by name this madeleine in spite of nay perhaps on the strength of a pimpled complexion and a viper-like length of spine had made up her mind that some day she would be madame pons but in vain she dangled twenty thousand francs of savings before the old bachelor's eyes pons had declined happiness accompanied by so many pimples from that time forth the dido of the antechamber who fain had called her master and mistress cousin wreaked her spite in petty ways upon the poor musician she heard him on the stairs and cried audibly oh here comes the sponger she stinted him of wine when she waited at table in the footman's absence she filled the water-glass to the brim to give him the difficult task of lifting it without spilling a drop or she would pass the old man over altogether till the mistress of the house would remind her and in what a tone it brought the colour to the poor cousin's face or she would spill the gravy over his clothes in short she waged petty war after the manner of a petty nature knowing that she could annoy an unfortunate superior with impunity madeleine vivet was madame de marville's maid and housekeeper she had lived with monsieur and madame camusot de marville since their marriage she had shared the early struggles in the provinces when monsieur camusot was a judge at alencon she had helped them to exist when monsieur camusot president of the tribunal of mantes came to paris in eighteen twenty eight to be an examining magistrate she was therefore too much one of the family not to wish for reasons of her own to revenge herself upon them beneath her desire to pay a trick upon her haughty and ambitious mistress and to call her master her cousin there surely lurked a long stifled hatred built up like an avalanche upon the pebble of some past grievance here comes your monsieur pons madame still wearing that spencer of his madeleine came to tell the presidente he really might tell me how he manages to make it look the same for five-and-twenty years together madame camusot de marville hearing a man's footstep in the little drawing-room between the large drawing-room and her bedroom looked at her daughter and shrugged her shoulders you always make these announcements so cleverly that you leave me no time to think madeleine jean is out madame i was all alone monsieur pons rang the bell i opened the door and as he is almost one of the family i could not prevent him from coming after me there he is taking off his spencer poor little puss said the presidente addressing her daughter we are caught we shall have to dine at home now let us see she added seeing that the dear puss wore a piteous face must we get rid of him for good oh poor man cried mademoiselle camusot deprive him of one of his dinners somebody coughed significantly in the next room by way of warning that he could hear very well let him come in said madame camusot looking at madeleine with another shrug you are here so early cousin that you have come in upon us just as mother was about to dress said cecile camusot in a coaxing tone but cousin pons had caught sight of the presidente's shrug and felt so cruelly hurt that he could not find a compliment and contented himself with the profound remark you are always charming my little cousin then turning to the mother he continued with a bow you will not take it amiss i think if i have come a little earlier than usual dear cousin i have brought something for you you once did me the pleasure of asking me for it poor pons every time he addressed the president the president's wife or cecile as cousin he gave them excruciating annoyance as he spoke he drew a long narrow cherry-wood box marvellously carved from his coat-pocket oh did i i had forgotten the lady answered dryly it was a heartless speech was it not 
did not those few words deny all merit to the pains taken for her by the cousin whose one offence lay in the fact that he was a poor relation but it is very kind of you cousin she added how much do i owe you for this little trifle pons quivered inwardly at the question he had meant the trinket as a return for his dinners i thought that you would permit me to offer it you he faltered out what said madame camusot oh but there need be no ceremony between us we know each other well enough to wash our linen among ourselves i know very well that you are not rich enough to give more than you get and to go no further it is quite enough that you should have spent a good deal of time in running among the dealers if you were asked to pay the full price of the fan my dear cousin you would not care to have it answered poor pons hurt and insulted it is one of watteau's masterpieces painted on both sides but you may be quite easy cousin i did not give one hundredth part of its value as a work of art to tell a rich man that he is poor you might as well tell the archbishop of granada that his homilies show signs of senility madame la presidente proud of her husband's position of the estate of marville and her invitations to court balls was keenly susceptible on this point and what was worse the remark came from a poverty-stricken musician to whom she had been charitable then the people of whom you buy things of this kind are very stupid are they she asked quickly stupid dealers are unknown in paris pons answered almost dryly then you must be very clever put in cecile by way of calming the dispute clever enough to know a lancre a watteau a pater or Greuze when i see it little cousin but anxious most of all to please your dear mamma madame de marville ignorant and vain was unwilling to appear to receive the slightest trifle from the parasite and here her ignorance served her admirably she did not even know the name of watteau and on the other hand if anything can measure the extent of the collector's passion which in truth is one of the most deeply seated of all passions rivalling the very vanity of the author if anything can give an idea of the lengths to which a collector will go it is the audacity which pons displayed on this occasion as he held his own against his lady cousin for the first time in twenty years he was amazed at his own boldness he made cecile see the beauties of the delicate carving on the sticks of this wonder and as he talked to her his face grew serene and gentle again but without some sketch of the presidente it is impossible fully to understand the perturbation of heart from which pons suffered madame de marville had been short and fair plump and fresh at forty-six she was as short as ever but she looked dried up an arched forehead and thin lips that had been softly colored once lent a soured look to a face naturally disdainful and now grown hard and unpleasant with a long course of absolute domestic rule time had deepened her fair hair to a harsh chestnut hue the pride of office intensified by suppressed envy looked out of eyes that had lost none of their brightness nor their satirical expression as a matter of fact madame camusot de marville felt almost poor in the society of self-made wealthy bourgeois with whom pons dined she could not forgive the rich retail druggist ex-president of the commercial court for his successive elevations as deputy member of the government count and peer of france she could not forgive her father-in-law for putting himself forward instead of his eldest son as deputy of his arrondissement after popinot's promotion to the peerage after eighteen years of services in paris she was still waiting for the post of councillor of the court of cassation for her husband it was camusot's own incompetence well known at the law courts which excluded him from the council the home secretary of eighteen forty four even regretted camusot's nomination to the presidency of the court of indictments in eighteen thirty four though thanks to his past experience as an examining magistrate he made himself useful in drafting decrees 
these disappointments had told upon madame de marville who moreover had formed a tolerably correct estimate of her husband a temper naturally shrewish was soured till she grew positively terrible she was not old but she had aged she deliberately set herself to extort by fear all that the world was inclined to refuse her and was harsh and rasping as a file caustic to excess she had few friends among women she surrounded herself with prim elderly matrons of her own stamp who lent each other mutual support and people stood in awe of her as for poor pons his relations with this fiend in petticoats were very much those of a schoolboy with the master whose one idea of communication is the ferule the presidente had no idea of the value of the gift she was puzzled by her cousin's sudden access of audacity then where did you find this inquired cecile as she looked closely at the trinket in the rue de lappe a dealer in second-hand furniture there had just brought it back with him from a chateau that is being pulled down near Dreux aulnay madame de pompadour used to spend part of her time there before she built menard some of the most splendid wood-carving ever known has been saved from destruction lienard our most famous living wood-carver had kept a couple of oval frames for models as the ne plus ultra of the art so fine it is there were treasures in that place my man found the fan in the drawer of an inlaid what-not which i should certainly have bought if i were collecting things of the kind but it is quite out of the question a single piece of reasoner's furniture is worth three or four thousand francs people here in paris are just beginning to find out that the famous french and german marquetry workers of the sixteenth seventeenth and eighteenth centuries composed perfect pictures in wood it is a collector's business to be ahead of the fashion why in five years time the frankenthal ware which i have been collecting these twenty years will fetch twice the price of sevres pat tendre what is frankenthal ware asked cecile that is the name of the porcelain made by the elector of the palatinate it dates further back than our manufactory at sevres just as the famous gardens at heidelberg laid waste by turenne had the bad luck to exist before the garden of versailles sevres copied frankenthal to a large extent in justice to the germans it must be said that they have done admirable work in saxony and in the palatinate mother and daughter looked at one another as if pons were speaking chinese no one can imagine how ignorant and exclusive parisians are they only learn what they are taught and that only when they choose and how do you know the frankenthal ware when you see it and by the mark cried pons with enthusiasm there is a mark on every one of those exquisite masterpieces frankenthal ware is marked with a c and t for charles theodore interlaced and crowned on old dresden china there are two crossed swords and the number of the order in gilt figures vincennes bears a hunting horn vienna a v closed and barred you can tell berlin by the two bars mayence by the wheel and sevres by the two crossed l's the queen's porcelain is marked a for antoinette with a royal crown above it in the eighteenth century all the crowned heads of europe had rival porcelain factories and workmen were kidnapped watteau designed services for the dresden factory they fetch frantic prices at the present day one has to know what one is about with them too for they are turning out imitations now at dresden wonderful things they used to make they will never make the like again oh pshaw no cousin some inlaid work and some kinds of porcelain will never be made again just as there will never be another raphael nor titian nor rembrandt nor van eyck nor cranach well now there are the chinese they are very ingenious very clever they make modern copies of their grand mandarin porcelain as it is called but a pair of vases of genuine grand mandarin vases of the largest size are worth six eight and ten thousand francs while you can buy the modern replicas for a couple of hundred 
you are joking you are astonished at the prices but that is nothing cousin a dinner service of sevres pate tendre and pate tendre is not porcelain a complete dinner service of sevres pate tendre for twelve persons is not merely worth a hundred thousand francs but that is the price charged on the invoice such a dinner service cost fifteen thousand francs at sevres in seventeen fifty i have seen the original invoices but let us go back to this fan said cecile evidently in her opinion the trinket was an old-fashioned thing you can understand that as soon as your dear mamma did me the honour of asking for a fan i went round of all the curiosity shops in paris but i found nothing fine enough i wanted nothing less than a masterpiece for the dear presidente and thought of giving her one that once belonged to marie antoinette the most beautiful of all celebrated fans but yesterday i was dazzled by this divine chef d'oeuvre which certainly must have been ordered by louis the fifteenth himself do you ask how i came to look for fans in the rue de lappe among an auvergnat stack of brass and iron and ormolu furniture well i myself believe that there is an intelligence in works of art they know art lovers they call to them madame de marville shrugged her shoulders and looked at her daughter pons did not notice the rapid pantomime i know all those sharpers continued pons so i asked him anything fresh to-day daddy monistrol for he always lets me look over his lots before the big buyers come and at that he began to tell me how Léonard, that did such beautiful work for the government in the chapelle de Dreux, had been at the aulnay sale and rescued the carved panels out of the clutches of the paris dealers while their heads were running on china and inlaid furniture i did not do much myself he went on but i may make my travelling expenses out of this and he showed me a what-not a marvel boucher's designs executed in marquetry and with such art one could have gone down on one's knees before it look sir he said i have just found this fan in a little drawer it was locked i had to force it open you might tell me where i can sell it and with that he brings out this little carved cherry wood box see says he it is the kind of pompadour that looks like decorated gothic yes i told him the box is pretty the box might suit me but as for the fan monistrol i have no madame pons to give the old trinket to and they make very pretty new ones nowadays you can buy miracles of painting on vellum cheaply enough there are two thousand painters in paris you know and i opened out the fan carelessly keeping down my admiration looked indifferently at those two exquisite little pictures touched off with an ease fit to send you into raptures i held madame de pompadour's fan in my hand watteau had done his utmost for this what do you want for the what-not oh a thousand francs i have had a bid already i offered him a price for the fan corresponding with the probable expenses of the journey we looked each other in the eyes and i saw that i had my man i put the fan back into the box lest my auvergnat should begin to look at it and went into ecstasies over the box indeed it is a jewel if i take it said i it is for the sake of the box the box tempts me as for the what-not you will get more than a thousand francs for that just see how the brass is wrought it is a model there is business in it it has never been copied it is a unique specimen made solely for madame de pompadour and so on till my man all on fire for his what-not forgets the fan and lets me have it for a mere trifle because i have pointed out the beauties of his piece of reasoner's furniture so here it is but it needs a great deal of experience to make a bargain such as that it is a jewel eye to eye and who has such eyes as a jew or an auvergnat the old artist's wonderful pantomime his vivid eager way of telling the story of the triumph of his shrewdness over the dealer's ignorance would have made a subject for a dutch painter but it was all thrown away upon the audience 
mother and daughter exchanged cold contemptuous glances what an oddity they seemed to say so it amuses you remarked madame de marville the question sent a cold chill through pons he felt a strong desire to slap the presidente why my dear cousin that is the way to hunt down a work of art you are face to face with antagonists that dispute the game with you it is craft against craft a work of art in the hands of a norman an auvergnat or a jew is like a princess guarded by magicians in a fairy tale and how can you tell that this is by what what do you call him watteau cousin one of the greatest eighteenth-century painters in france look do you not see that it is his work pointing to a pastoral scene court shepherd swains and shepherdesses dancing in a ring the movement the life in it the colouring there it is see painted with a stroke of the brush as a writing-master makes a flourish with a pen not a trace of effort here and turn it over look a ball in a drawing-room summer and winter and what ornaments and how well preserved it is the hinge-pen is gold you see and on cleaning it i found a tiny ruby at either side if it is so cousin i could not think of accepting such a valuable present from you it would be better to lay up the money for yourself said madame de marville but all the same she asked no better than to keep the splendid fan it is time that it should pass from the service of vice into the hands of virtue said the good soul recovering his assurance it has taken a century to work the miracle no princess at court you may be sure will have anything to compare with it for unfortunately men will do more for a pompadour than for a virtuous queen such is human nature very well madame de marville said laughing i will accept your present cecile my angel go to madeleine and see that dinner is worthy of your cousin madame de marville wished to make matters even her request made aloud in defiance of all rules of good taste sounded so much like an attempt to repay at once the balance due to the poor cousin that pons flushed red like a girl found out in fault the grain of sand was a little too large for some moments he could only let it work in his heart cecile a red-haired young woman with a touch of pedantic affectation combined her father's ponderous manner with a trace of her mother's hardness she went and left poor pons face to face with the terrible presidente end of chapter four chapter five of cousin pons by honore de balzac translated by ellen marriage this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter five how nice she is my little lili said the mother she still called her cecile by this baby name charming said pons twirling his thumbs i cannot understand these times in which we live broke out the presidente what is the good of having a president of the court of appeal in paris and a commander of the legion of honor for your father and for a grandfather the richest wholesale silk merchant in paris a deputy and a millionaire that will be a peer of france some of these days the president's zeal for the new government had in fact recently been rewarded with a commander's ribbon thanks to his friendship with popinot said the envious popinot himself modest though he was had as has been seen accepted the title of count for his son's sake he told his numerous friends men look for nothing but money nowadays said cousin pons no one thinks anything of you unless you are rich and what would it have been if heaven had spared my poor little charles cried the lady oh with two children you would be poor returned the cousin it practically means the division of the property but you need not trouble yourself cousin cecile is sure to marry sooner or later she is the most accomplished girl i know 
to such depths had pons fallen by adapting himself to the company of his entertainers in their houses he echoed their ideas and said the obvious thing after the manner of a chorus in a greek play he did not dare to give free play to the artist's originality which had overflowed in bright repartee when he was young he had effaced himself till he had almost lost his individuality and if the real ponce appeared as he had done a moment ago he was immediately repressed but i myself was married with only twenty thousand francs for my portion in eighteen nineteen cousin and it was you a woman with a head on your shoulders and the royal protection of louis the eighteenth but still my child is a perfect angel she is clever she has a warm heart she will have a hundred thousand francs on her wedding day to say nothing of the most brilliant expectations and yet she stays on our hands and so on and so on for twenty minutes madame de marville talked on about herself and her cecile pitying herself after the manner of mothers in bondage to marriageable daughters pons had dined at the house every week for twenty years and camusot de marville was the only cousin he had in the world but he had yet to hear the first word spoken as to his own affairs nobody cared to know how he lived here and elsewhere the poor cousin was a kind of sink down which his relatives poured domestic confidences his discretion was well known indeed was he not bound over to silence when a single imprudent word would have shut the door of ten houses upon him and he must combine his role of listener with a second part he must applaud continually smile on every one accuse nobody defend nobody from his point of view every one must be in the right and so in the house of his kinsman pons no longer counted as a man he was a digestive apparatus in the course of a long tirade madame camusot de marville avowed with due circumspection that she was prepared to take almost any son-in-law with her eyes shut she was even disposed to think that at eight-and-forty or so a man with twenty thousand francs a year was a good match cecile is in her twenty-third year if it should fall out so unfortunately that she is not married before she is five or six and twenty it will be extremely hard to marry her at all when a girl reaches that age people want to know why she has been so long on hand we are a good deal talked about in our set we have come to the end of all the ordinary excuses she is so young she is so fond of her father and mother that she doesn't like to leave them she is so happy at home she is hard to please she would like a good name we are beginning to look silly i feel that distinctly and besides cecile is tired of waiting poor child she suffers in what way pons was noodle enough to ask why because it is humiliating to her to see all her girl-friends married before her replied the mother with a duenna's air but cousin has anything happened since the last time that i had the pleasure of dining here why do you think of men of eight and forty pons inquired humbly this has happened returned the president we were to have had an interview with a court councillor his son is thirty years old and very well to do and monsieur de marville would have obtained a post in the audit office for him and paid the money the young man is a supernumerary there at present and now they tell us that he has taken it into his head to rush off to italy in the train of a duchess from the bal mabille it is nothing but a refusal in disguise the fact is the young man's mother is dead he has an income of thirty thousand francs and more to come at his father's death and they don't care about the match for him you have just come in in the middle of all this dear cousin so you must excuse our bad temper while pons was casting about for the complimentary answer which invariably occurred to him too late when he was afraid of his host madeleine came in handed a folded note to the presidente and waited for an answer the note ran as follows dear mamma 
if we pretend that this note comes to you from papa at the palais and that he wants us both to dine with his friend because proposals have been renewed then the cousin will go and we can carry out our plan of going to the popinots who brought the master's note the presidente asked quickly a lad from the salle du palais the withered waiting woman unblushingly answered and her mistress knew at once that madeleine had woven the plot with cecile now at the end of her patience tell him that we will both be there at half-past five madeleine had no sooner left the room than the presidente turned to cousin pons with that insincere friendliness which is about as grateful to a sensitive soul as a mixture of milk and vinegar to the palate of an epicure dinner is ordered dear cousin you must dine without us my husband has just sent word from the court that the question of the marriage has been reopened and we are to dine with the councillor we need not stand on ceremony at all do just as if you were at home i have no secrets from you i am perfectly open with you as you see i am sure you would not wish to break off the little darling's marriage i cousin on the contrary i should like to find some one for her but in my circle oh that is not at all likely said the presidente cutting him short insolently then you will stay will you not cecile will keep you company while i dress oh i can dine somewhere else cousin cruelly hurt though he was by her way of casting up his poverty to him the prospect of being left alone with the servants was even more alarming but why should you dinner is ready you may just as well have it if you do not the servants will eat it at that atrocious speech pons started up as if he had received a shock from a galvanic battery bowed stiffly to the lady and went to find his spencer now it so happened that the door of cecile's bedroom beyond the little drawing-room stood open and looking into the mirror he caught sight of the girl shaking with laughter as she gesticulated and made signs to her mother the old artist understood beyond a doubt that he had been the victim of some cowardly hoax pons went slowly down the stairs he could not keep back the tears he understood that he had been turned out of the house but why and wherefore he did not know i am growing too old he told himself the world has a horror of old age and poverty two ugly things after this i will not go anywhere unless i am asked heroic resolve downstairs the great gate was shut as it usually is in houses occupied by the proprietor the kitchen stood exactly opposite the porter's lodge and the door was open pons was obliged to listen while madeleine told the servants the whole story amid the laughter of the servants she had not expected him to leave so soon the footman loudly applauded a joke at the expense of a visitor who was always coming to the house and never gave you more than three francs at the year's end yes put in the cook but if he cuts up rough and does not come back there will be three francs the less for some of us on new year's day eh, how is he to know retorted the footman pooh said madeleine a little sooner or a little later what difference does it make the people at the other houses where he dines are so tired of him that they are going to turn him out the gate if you please madeleine had scarcely uttered the words when they heard the old musician's call to the porter it sounded like a cry of pain there was a sudden silence in the kitchen he heard the footman said well and if he did so much the worser or rather so much the better retorted madeleine he is an arrant skinflint poor pons had lost none of the talk in the kitchen he heard it all even to the last word he made his way home along the boulevards in the same state physical and mental as an old woman after a desperate struggle with burglars as he went he talked to himself in quick spasmodic jerks his honour had been wounded and the pain of it drove him on as a gust of wind whirls away a straw he found himself at last in the boulevard du temple how he had come thither he could not tell it was five o'clock 
and strange to say he had completely lost his appetite but if the reader is to understand the revolution which pons's unexpected return at that hour was to work in the rue de normandie the promised biography of madame cibot must be given in this place End of chapter five